most people are horrified about what they see themselves doing because we don't know what we look like. Our friends know because they're looking at us with an iPhone or with a, a video. You can film yourself interacting as a training course, play it back with the sound off. And I ask your mates who don't know what it's about to comment on what they think you were thinking. And you'd be surprised. You thought you'd been really friendly, but in fact, you might have been coming across as disinterested or aggressive. You're listening to Elevate, the official podcast of elite agent for real estate industry, sales professionals, property managers, and leaders. We bring you the best minds in business and real estate to help you list more, sell more, and elevate your results. To download your written action guide from this podcast containing extra tips, links, and shortcuts, visit EliteAgentElevate.com. Now, here is your host, Samantha McLean. Welcome to another episode of the Elevate Podcast, where we delve into some of the most interesting minds in business and in real estate for the very best tips and strategies for you to implement to elevate your business. I'm Samantha McLean, editor of Elite Agent and host of this week's show. It's fairly crazy times that we're living in the moment, so Mark Edwards has joined me back in the studio again today. I'm back. Not really that I've ever actually left. No. (laughs) No, you're always in the next room. And I guess, you know, like we're in a bit of the unusual situation just for listeners is that our office in North Sydney happens to be 500 metres up the road from where we live. Mm. And so I guess when you're in a husband and wife kind of business at the end of the end of the day, the requirement for social distancing is made that much easier because normally you produce the podcast and I'm in here and, you know, it's not been made more difficult by... It's, it's actually quite funny, actually, because every time that we, we do, you know, sort of a podcast or a webinar, it's like sort of, you know, husband, wife, social distancing, okay. Yeah, we, we have to we have to point out that that's okay because remember when we um, interviewed Pancho when the mm. crisis first broke out, Pancho was going to come in the studio and I actually said to him, no, 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 wait a second, you can't come in here because mm. we couldn't get the cameras at the right angle where we would be three yeah, feet apart. Yeah, it changes so rapidly. And for a few weeks now, we've been living with this new normal. That's probably one of the main reasons why we're coming together with, with doing an intro to this particular podcast. Well, yeah, like it's been tough out there for the last few weeks. And, you know, we know it's been tough for you guys. And I guess together, we just wanted to say, we hope you're doing okay. And trying to do our best also to bring you topics and things like that that are going to be helpful, which leads us to today's podcast, Mm. which is with Aussie legend Alan Pease. Legend. Legend. He is a bit of a legend. I remember Alan Pease from when he was on the Ray Martin show. Like if ever I was at home sick, (laughs) I used to sit and watch Kerry Ann and Ray and things like that. Now I'm dating myself a little bit. Yeah, but Alan was always on the show. So he's someone like that I felt that I knew. And when his people contacted us suggesting that he become a contributor in the magazine, I was like, what? That's amazing. Like, (laughs) Alan Pease wants to contribute to the magazine. And there was an article, Actions Speak Louder Than Words. In the last issue. Which was in the last Mm -hmm. issue. Anyway, so I, I said, that's great. And his people, Vicky, the lovely Vicky, said to me, well, Alan is actually going to be in Sydney because he's based up in Queensland. He's going to be in Sydney in March. So would you like to do an interview with him face-to-face? And, of course, I jumped at that opportunity too. But then COVID happened. And it's disrupted everyone, hasn't it? <laughs> yes. It's, it's the, I actually said it the other day. It's the ultimate disruptor. We've been looking at, you know, sort of tech and dis- discounters and, and Uber's, but it's actually been pandemic. a virus that's been the disruptor to everything we're doing. Totally. So to cut a long story short, because I feel like this has been a long story already. <laughs> land, land the plane. Yeah, land the plane. So we had to call off that interview, but then we rescheduled the interview via Zoom. Mm. And then I thought, wouldn't it be interesting, because Alan's the guy about body language. Mm. And so, you know, all of the principles of body language, like, you know, proximity and smiling and, and things like that, they're all out the window with social distancing. The old distancing. playbook is gone, isn't it? The old playbook is gone. So... As I was getting ready for this interview, I thought, wouldn't it be interesting to ask Alan some questions around how to build rapport via Zoom? Because the game has changed. Mm. And so you'll hear Alan say some really interesting things in this. And and I tell you what, the day that I interviewed Alan, it was exactly what I needed because I'd been feeling down with the news and everything. Mm. And he was so funny and so engaging and so gregarious that he could have been sitting in this room, but he was actually, in fact, via Zoom. The irony of this, I was in the next room and I was hearing you absolutely howling with laughter. He is. He's a crack up. Yeah. And, and it's actually quite interesting to, to hear that, particularly if you can't hear the other end. Yeah. What are you on, Sam? What's, what's going on? <laughs> what's going on? Well, he was raising his eyebrows at me and doing a whole lot of other things, which 
has led us to, well, obviously this is a podcast, but we do record all of our Zooms via video. And so we're actually making the whole video available to our pro members Mm -hmm. and also in our latest Body Language Basics course. So you're the academy man. So yep. tell us a bit about how this is going to work. So so what we're going to be doing is we're going to be embedding this video into the Body Language Basics course. And what we've done over the last couple of weeks is introduce a new, I suppose, payment option, which is pay what you can. Because we realise there's a whole heap of people that are doing it tough at the moment. Yep. But you know, so it's so important at the moment to keep your skills ready and up to date so that when you're able to, A, transact, have relationships in this non-contact environment, but also be ready for when we go back to to normal BAU. But normal is not going to be normal anymore. So basically, we've taken away the excuse of, I can't afford it. Mm. So it really is. <laughs> yeah, it really literally you can. is. Make us an offer. So, um, yeah. so if you visit eliteagent.com slash courses, you'll be able to see the information there. You'll see all the courses that are available. Look for the Body Language Basics course, and you'll be able to get access to a whole heap of great useful information and also the video of From Alan. this podcast, you can you can see him in all of his glory. And he was, you know, we made a joke about wearing shorts under the table, and he, in and fact, he was. was. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was really, really cool. So anyway, if you want to get visibility of what that podcast is like in the behind the scenes from a video side of things, God, that's confusing. But anyway, you get the idea. EliteAgent.com slash courses. Yeah, absolutely. And if you want all the notes and things like that to the show, it's the usual URL, which is EliteAgentElevate.com. I think that covers a lot. It's been fun being back. I, <laughs> I think that does cover a lot. And I think that's it now. I hope you guys are staying safe and healthy and socially distanced. And we'll catch you guys soon. Enjoy the show. Take care. Welcome to the podcast, Alan Pease. Thank you, Samantha. Glad to be. Well, it's absolutely a pleasure to have you here. I feel like I've, I feel like I've known your voice for years, and that we're meeting for the first time. But I feel like we've known each other for forever because you've been part of everyone's life in terms of your body language expertise for so long. Are there any other people that often come up to you and say, "I feel like I know you"? Well, well yeah. I mean, I've been doing this for fifty-one years now, so this is what I've done virtually all my life since the late sixties. I was in an elevator recently in, in South Australia. This guy got in with me, a complete stranger, and he looked at me and he said, look, I've been meaning to ask you a question. And he asked me a question and I answered it as though we were best friends and neighbours. Then he got out and said, thanks, Alan, off he went. And I didn't know who he was and uh, he knew who I was because he said, oh, I've been watching you since I was a kid at school. I used to come over for lunch in the country and watch you on the Ray Martin show. And, and that happened frequently because I've been doing this you know, since the late 70s when the Mike Walsh show, as it was called back in those days. I was one of the first to start with Kerry Ann when she was 21 years of age. I was one of her first guests. And I can remember her as a nervous blonde. Now she's, uh, of course, she's, you don't see her on television that much now. Looks as good as she did then. <laughs> it does happen regularly. In fact, I sat at a seminar recently. Oh, it must be four months ago. That's a bit, that's recent in the seminar business. And I had this woman sitting beside me and the meeting was all official. It was a bit slow and they had an accountant talking about the budget and everything and I was like after dinner speaker. And this woman was sitting there and she leaned across and I said to her, I know exactly what you're thinking. And she said, why don't you go there? <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh. I, well, see, the reason I feel like I know you, I think, is, and this is going to date me too a little bit, I fear, is that I can remember, I think you had a book called Why Women Can't Read Maps and, and something else. Men and I can listen. remember. Yes, men don't listen. Yeah, can't read maps, yeah. So. And I remember when I was learning to drive, I had a job where I had to go from legal office to legal office. Mm -hmm. And as a girl from the Central Coast navigating her around in Sydney for the first time, I used to have that street directory, the old big heavy Refidex, balanced on my knees, (laughs) trying to balance the steering wheel, trying to turn the damn thing upside down. And and then I I heard one of your talks and I thought, this guy knows me. He knows my pain. You were normal. Well, what that book did for most people who read it, it was was, actually was our biggest ever seller. We sold nearly 15 million copies of that in every language. And, And whatever language they read that book in, whether it's Finnish or Chinese or Afrikaans, they actually feel like uh, I've been looking through their window, writing down what I've been seeing and hearing because uh, in any relationship, every man and woman feels like they're the only one. They're the only one who's 
is married to some guy, living with some guy, he can't find things in the fridge. You know, where's the butter? He's right in front of his face. He can't find his car keys. His shirt's gone. Pots and pans are hidden in the kitchen. Uh, but you and three billion other women, and every guy in the world thinks he's the only guy who's living with or married a woman who, who won't get to the point and keeps changing the subject without warning. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I love the day that we finally got electronic navigators and that I didn't have to keep turning that damn big street directory upside down again. I, I think that that moved us forward a long way as drivers. But um, Well, GPS was women's big saviour for cars. Mm. Be three out of five women, as you would have read from the book, uh, don't have the spatial ability in the right brain. Historically, they never needed it. Their spatial ability is your ability to look at an animal in the distance, work out how far away it is, how fast it's running, how big it is, because the further away it gets, the smaller it looks. Then you've got to estimate and calculate how fast you have to run, what angle you've got to run at with a spear or rock of a certain weight, and when you release it to hit it. And that's what it's about. It's hunting skill, which translates today into reverse parking, the building industry, anything is three-dimensional. And, and your foremothers never needed that. They've, that. they've got other skills, and you've got other skills that men just don't understand some of them at all, particularly communication skills. So the thing about these things is that they're, they're not better or worse, they're differences. That's the important mm. thing to understand. And, and I think I've, that book, Why Men Don't Listen Women Can't Read Maps, eased a lot of pain for men and women because women who would have the repodex on their knee turning it around, trying to work out how does this match the horizon, and it doesn't. And the reason it doesn't because repodex is designed by men for other <laughs> men to read while they're heading north. Now, if you're a woman, where the hell is north? <laughs> who cares where north is? <laughs> you ask me which way do you go? We go, we go down to the end of the street to turn right, Go two kilometres, turn left, then head south. Now, if you've got a female brain without space, where the hell is that? Whereas if I said to you, look, you just go as far as you can go to you see the McDonald's sign, and over behind that you'll see a Suzanne shop with a 30% discount, you'd find it in no time. In other words, you landmarks. That's how women navigate it. Very true, yeah. <laughs> I, I always knew that that was some sort of a plot against me, but anyway. Yeah, well, no, it's not a plot, and that's, that's the thing. Men and women think that there is a plot, but... And we said to men, like, if, if you're living with a woman, I, I am too, Barbara cannot read a map to save her life. She had no spatial skills at all. She wouldn't know how to fix a busted wheel on a supermarket trolley. Now, here's the point. It doesn't matter. And she now realises it's not an issue that she personally has and she doesn't care. So she hands me car keys when we're in a duplicate response and said, darling, will you park this? And I go and park it and I become a hero. Now, 30 years ago, I didn't do that. I would say, now, look, if you could learn to park, if you could learn to drive, if you could read these maps, we wouldn't be lost in the middle of Europe somewhere. And she'd say, well, if you'd stop and ask directions, which I'm not doing, by the way, she said, if you do that, we wouldn't be here in the first place. Now, it turns off neither of us are right or wrong. These are differences, and, and that book addressed the differences and made everybody feel quite normal. Rather than feeling you've got some liability, you're not. It's a normal thing. It doesn't mean you can't learn to be better at parking or asking directions, but... Why stress yourself into something that's not part of your hard wiring if you don't need to? So Barbara doesn't park the car at all. She, she, I, I don't think she's driven backwards, Sam, in about 12 years, 13 years. The reverse gear never gets used. She, if she needs to park it somewhere in a hotel if we're at a conference, she'll pay $5 to the porter and he'll be really happy to go and park it in the rain while she has a cappuccino. And she calls that outsourcing. Yeah, absolutely. I, I call it that too. And and I think, you know, that's that's what you call playing to your strengths. Absolutely. So I'm completely in favour of that. Now, this is a very odd time for us to be talking. So we organised this interview a couple of months ago, but but obviously now we're living with social distancing. Yeah. You're all about the body language, but we're living with social distancing at the moment. And I can remember I kind of grew up with some of the lessons because I was in sales for a number of years and the whole thing about body language is the close proximity between people and we judge how interested people are in us or not interested in us by a proximity thing. This is strange at the moment. How, how are you coaching people on, on body language right now with all this social distancing going on? Well, there's not a lot of coaching going on because conferences have been cancelled. What is going on is like we are right now. It's electronic, which is really a second best because electronic, we can only see each other from the navel up. So we can't see other signals that are happening underneath. But the- I'm wearing bodies. <laughs> well, I got a pair of shorts no, on. You don't, have, you don't believe me. <laughs> you don't believe I've got shorts on, do you? <laughs> <laughs> Old television trick. But the thing is that if we're face to face, we get full body. So we can see minor changes of pupil dilation, or we can see cheek colour changes. We can see minor things that you you won't necessarily see on a screen. But the advantage a screen does have 
is, is that you can do what we're doing now. You can actually study that person's face and not look away, which face to face, we can't do that. We look at someone two thirds, we look away at one third. That's in Western city cultures. And most European and Westernized countries have about two thirds looking time, one third look away. So look two thirds, look away a third. Now on a Skype or a Zoom call like we're doing now, you can actually stare at a person, which is why it's very important you're going to have a Zoom call, which is uh, we encourage everybody to do this, is to make sure that everything about your face is right, that you've, if you're a fellow that you've had a shave or you're a woman that you've got your makeup exact. everything's got to be right because if you've got a flaw, everybody's going to see it. We're face-to-face in real life, but they might miss it. And also face-to-face, we're distracted by what's happening around us, so we're focusing actually less. But right now, I can stare at your face, you can stare at mine because we're in a static environment. So that's why... These sort of calls, which are very important for humans, because we're social creatures. You need to make sure the background is right and the setting is right. Because if you've got one little bit of uh, lunch sticking on your cheek here, everybody's going to see it and they remember it. Yeah. So that's interesting, actually, because a lot of people freak out about meeting people for the first time, particularly if it's in a sales situation, person to person. But what you're actually saying is, is this environment is more heightened. So you have to be even more particular about how you look, how you're standing, how you're presenting yourself. Otherwise, people will remember it. But with a Zoom call, exactly. And the good thing about a Zoom call, you can control what's behind you by adjusting your screen. And you see so many people who don't do this. You see them on television at the moment, the experts being interviewed, particularly the medical field. Behind them is a blank wall I had a guy the other day, he had a, had a stuffed animal hanging on the wall and the activists were all upset about that. And when they interviewed Prince Charles recently in his office in England, he had three copies of Fifty Shades of Grey in his library behind his head. <laughs> Probably not a good look for the royal family. <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, okay, so that, that's really important in looking at, at the background because people are actually going to judge you. Do, you. do you have any other tips of how to be a more effective communicator if it is electronic rather than face-to-face? Yes, a number of things you need to do because people are largely going to see from the mid-chest up, which is going to be shoulders and head. There are three things that you need to practice. Now, the background we've just talked about, that's critical to, to establish credibility. That's why you see so many experts uh, with a library behind them full of books. Now, the reality is nobody reads books, but we can still associate that library with credibility. So you need to have some sort of credibility certificates or library, something behind you. Now, three signals that you can use constantly, and you want to practice these in front of a mirror when you're doing these type of calls. One is smiling with your teeth visible. And the reason this is so important, this is primate behaviour, Sam. It's, it's not animal behaviour. If a monkey or a chimp or a human shows its teeth to you, we're the only animals that do that that don't bite. <laughs> if a dog smiles at you or a shark smiles at you, you're in trouble, right? If they have sharp pointed teeth, these are attack teeth because they attack other animals. So when they a dog reveals his teeth to you, he's giving you a warning. If you keep coming closer, I'm going to use these on you. Now, if you look at our teeth, it gives you the indication as to why. It's a submission signal, which for primates primarily and for humans, we're the king of the primates, it's primarily... A submission signal. Now, it can also be used as a fear signal, but primarily it's submission. So when I smile at you like that, I'm showing you fruit choppers and nut grinders. These are herbivore teeth. These are vegetarian teeth. They're not scary. So when I reveal them, it affects the limbic part of your brain, which are the ancient parts. So when you met me for the first time, your brain is thinking in that first 10 seconds, will this person be my friend or my enemy? And the ancient brain is looking for signals that reveal the answer. Will you be friendly or aggressive? And uh, as the limbic part of the brain works on first meetings, in fact, on first meetings, people form up to 90% of their opinion about you in under four minutes. Most of that's formed in the first 10, 10 seconds. But up four minutes, we've decided whether we're going to give that person the nod or the flick, regardless of what they say. And we do this with everybody, whether we realise it or not. And the limbic brain is what's doing this. It's protecting you from a potential attack. And when you meet the person the second, third, fourth, the 15th, 22nd time, the limbic brain is not the part that's working. The front lobes are recalling the memories of what you remember of that person. And this is why you always remember the first time you met someone. You don't remember the fifth time. You don't couldn't recall the 17th or the 26th, but you always remember the first, which is why the old expression, you know, first impressions, you never get a second chance. That is absolutely scientifically true. The good thing about that, you can stage manage your first impressions by looking, as I'm doing now, like an expert who clearly knows what they're talking about. So if I hadn't had a shave, which, in fact, I haven't much, but hopefully I'm far enough back you won't notice that. Uh, if I hadn't had a shave and I, I looked like 
If I looked like the homeless and said exactly the same thing, you'd find a difficulty in believing anything I said. You'd be constantly challenging my credibility and saying what I'm saying. And so that's why people say, yeah, but yeah, we have dressed down Fridays where everybody wears jeans and they look relaxed. And this was introduced by the Americans and the computer company. One thing you never hear about is the amount of anarchy that takes place on Fridays because nobody can identify a leader. They're all the same level. You imagine if you had dressed down Friday in the police force or in the armed forces, everybody looked the same. People would be telling each other to go and get stuffed because they're not wearing badges to show their hierarchy. So smiling with your teeth visible is the first thing you must do with everybody, including uh, the other day I was I had a mask on, had my gloves on, I was in the supermarket, one of my rare trips out. I'm marooned at the moment. I'm like Tom Hanks on Castaway. Everybody's standing back at social distancing because they've got crosses on the floor where you stand. And uh, I look behind me and I can see three people on three crosses and they all look very, very unhappy and even suspicious. Now, this is a bit of an issue because depending on the culture in which you're raised and the country that you're raised in, let's talk about people in Western cultures here in, in cities primarily. We have a personal space, it's like an air bubble around us, it's around 48 centimetres. So when we talk to other people in a friendly situation, we stand roughly two half a metres, that is your bubble and mine. So it's just under one metre that we'll stand to feel comfortable. We angle our bodies away from each other at 45 degrees to form a right angle. And that's a non-threatening conversation. If you want to threaten someone or be intimate with them, you face them directly. If, if they cl- and put their hands on the hip, making you bigger. That make you take up more space, which can be potentially intimidating as well, or you're trying to get attention to yourself for either intimacy or for aggression. So um, and I look behind me and there's a woman, excuse me, an elderly woman, there's a guy in his 40s behind and they both look really grumpy. Now, I had my mask on. I realised I was smiling at them under the mask, but they couldn't see that. So I unhooked it and took it off and smiled and said, good morning. And then they went, oh, good morning. Because when people stand one and a half to two metres away, that's the, the space that we keep people we don't know or don't like. That's the distance you keep the electrician, the plumber and the builder that you don't know when you talk to them. That's the distance you keep away strangers where, where you've got a choice to keep them away. If your friends stand at one and a half to two metres, a couple of things happen. First of all, we know from studies of isolation that if you're standing at one and a half to two metres away from everybody, that your blood pressure increases, your depression levels increase, your chance of getting heart disease go up if it continues, and your chances of death increase dramatically, particularly for older people. Now, we're social creatures. We're not used to standing at one and a half to two metres away, but currently we have to do that because it's a health risk. But the downside is, and you don't hear anybody talk about this, is that we don't feel happy. So I looked at these two people. Now, if I hadn't have understood what this was about, about social, about personal intimate space, I might have thought those people are potential threats because they're not showing their teeth. They're not smiling. They're potentially angry. And you know what? I bet they were thinking, that guy with the mask, I bet he's an aggressive chap because they couldn't see any expressions. So showing your teeth with everybody you meet, hello, nice to meet you, hello. <laughs> I'm overacting it to make the point, but as long as they can see your teeth, it's important. Now, for women, this is a double-edged sword here. Women have a gesture of smiling that they use. Very few men use it, mostly female. That you, it's a smile you use if you really don't like the people or the circumstances you're in. It looks like this. <laughs> often known in Australia as the duck bum. I was going to say that's close to the grimace emoji too. Uh, well, well, yes, it is. Yes, exactly. You appear to be smiling but there's no teeth visible. So you're with somebody and you think, what a jerk this guy is, but you don't want to say you just want to look polite. And any woman who sees you doing that will say to her female friends, oh, look, Sam doesn't like him, doesn't like the circumstances. And if you say, how do you know? You say, oh, I can tell. That's what women say, oh, I can tell. They can't actually articulate what they're seeing because female brains are two to three times better in the hardwiring for reading these signals than men. That's why men don't really know when you're getting cheesed off with them. You might be giving them a tight little smile, but it's having no effect at all. Where any woman who sees it knows that you're not happy with that particular person or event. So the first thing you've got to do when you're on a call like this is make sure your teeth are visible and smile. Well, what if you're not feeling that happy? You woke up and you had a headache and you uh, and uh, you can't pay the mortgage and things that, you know, we're in a stressful time. Well, being happy, in fact, is a choice. You can choose to be happy or be unhappy. Now, if you really focus on what's being reported on the TV right now as we're talking, it's pretty horrific what's going on in the world. You know, this, this is one of the most deadly things in many aspects and it's probably ever happened in, in human history, it, bigger than the bubonic plague because that was confined to Europe, whereas this thing is in every country because we travel so much. So you can make a decision 
to be happy about circumstances and what you've got. Now, when people are under stress in circumstances like this, and when they're fearful, which they are, the mind automatically locks into self-defense. What can I do to survive? And to survive, you start thinking of the negative consequences of what somebody might do to you or what the circumstances might be. And that has the detrimental health effects here, as I mentioned a minute ago. So make a decision that whatever happens, you're going to be happy about today because you woke up alive and we know we're going to get through the crisis. We'll come out the other end. It'll be different to what it was when we went in there, but it'll be different and we will get through. The sun will definitely come up tomorrow morning, no doubt about it. When you're standing in the line at Woolies or on a Skype call like this with somebody who's got no expression on their face, maybe it's because you're standing more than a metre and a half to two metres away. Now, in our case, if we were together, we'd be standing probably three metres apart, wouldn't we? Because of Skype. Yeah. So it's, we've kept somebody at the at the long impersonal distance, uh, which again means that you're less likely to smile and use facial expressions. So the second expression on your face is this one. Watch this. I'll do a close up. Yeah. <laughs> yep, the eyebrow raise. It'll yep. probably cause a bit of wrinkling. If you've got Botox, you can't do this. I'm worried about yeah, that. Yeah, Botox. Well, we, we did a study with people with Botox in America. Uh, about 10 years ago in Los Angeles, and we found that with before and after photographs, where we got people to look at the before and after photographs of people with pre-Botox and post-Botox, they didn't know what Botox was involved. They just asked to go through and tick how friendly this person would be, how trustworthy, how reliable, how interesting, how good would you go on a date with them, etc. The Botox people rated really, really poorly in that because they couldn't make that expression. If you're talking with someone and they've got crow's feet in the corner of their eyes, what what does that crow's feet indicate? Well, that they've had a happy life, that they've smiled they a laugh. lot, that they've laughed a lot. Yeah. yeah. That they laugh and they're happy. And whether you know it or not, that's what gives you the cue to put in a little funny line of crack a joke because your brain says that person laughs, is happy and smiles. If it's perfectly Botoxed out, you find you're not telling those people jokes or funny lines because your brain's saying they're potentially aggressive because they don't laugh and smile. So in other words, wrinkles are actually really good for communication. Now, yeah. the eyebrow flash is an interesting one. It's primate behaviour like teeth bearing. Monkeys and chimps do it as well. So if there's two monkeys together and there's a, a lion approaching and one goes up this tree and one goes up the other tree. Now, the guy who went up that tree wants to make sure his mate knows that's the tree he went up. So they look at each other and they do this. So it's an eye-widening signal which communicates, I see you and I recognise that you're over there. Now, Chances are you might do this when you meet people in any case. I know I do because I've got the lines to prove it and I've seen myself on video doing it, but most people are not sure whether they do this or not. But if you don't do it, practice. When you meet people, just go, hello, split second. So, I think I'm doing it now just to mimic you. You actually. are. If you, do re- if you do a replay, you'll see this. So hi, I'm Alan. Hi. Hi. Now, I'm over here. Hi. Nice to meet you. Two signals that affect the limbic brain in the first four minutes where the person's ancient brain says, well, this person is non-threatening because they're showing their teeth. Secondly, they recognise and acknowledge that I'm actually here. So they feel significant. And the third thing you do when you're talking is this thing here, nodding your head as you talk. And you're doing it too. I've been watching you do it. Not more than three times though. One, two, three, stop. One, two, three, stop. Now, the reason that's important, in Western and European cultures, and not in Asian cultures, there's a, there's a cultural difference here, a group of three communicates, tell me more, tell me more, tell me more. More than three means shut up. <laughs> I'll give you an example, Sam. So, so tell me, how did you get started in this business? And I'll just nod. How did you get started in this business? Just talk about it. I uh, started as a writer, actually. So I was writing for somebody else. Right, yeah. And then? And then that magazine went south. Right. So then I decided to create my own. You see, I'm using three signals. One, two, yeah, three. on the third nod, it's a prompt to keep going. Right, now, let's let's have the same conversation, say the same things, except I'll change my nodding rate. So how did you get started in this business, Sam? I used to write for somebody else and... <laughs> that makes you stop. One, two, three, four, five minutes, shut up, I've heard enough. So chances are if, you, if you're with someone and that they might be raising an objection, and that, look, that the reality is in the real estate business, you hear the same things over and over again. You hear the same objections, the same questions. Uh, and for you, you heard it so many times because you're in the business. But the person who's raising it, it might be maybe one of the rare times they've ever brought it up. They think it's an original, but you've heard it every day of your life. And chances are you might say, oh, one, two, three, four, five, and suddenly they stop talking. They think, oh, she just shut me down. Because one, two, three, four, five is a shutdown signal. One, two, three, means tell me more. So you can practice this in front of a mirror. Practice this 
with your camera on your phone, with your friends, just going through normal face-to-face encounters and practice what you're doing with the skills and play it back a week later. And most people are horrified about what they see themselves doing because we don't know what, what we look like. Our friends know because they're looking at us. But the good thing about it with, a, with an iPhone or with a, a video, you can film yourself interacting as a training course, play it back with the sound off. Now, play it back the first time with the sound off and ask your mates who don't know what it's about to comment on what they think you were thinking. And you'd be surprised. You thought you'd been really friendly, but in fact, you might have been coming across as disinterested or aggressive. Mm. I've heard that particularly like some of the big speeches that history has seen in the world, like, for example, Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech, yeah. that when you turn the sound off that, you can actually get what he's saying through his body language, which proves how powerful it is. Well, body language makes up 60 to 80% of all face-to-face encounters. I often get the question about, now that we're in the electronic age, how relevant will body language be? Well, there's been a phase where we've gone through the SMS phase that we're still in, but now we've gone back into face-to-face, which is what we are now, through Skype or through Zoom. And reading body signals are exactly the same as if you're face-to-face. There's a few differences because we appear to be further away from each other. And you've got to be conscious of that because the further away you are, the less likely you are to show a facial expression. Whereas you and I are, say, three metres apart if we had it been live, but in fact, we're really only maybe 30 centimetres apart from each other on the screen, maybe 60 centimetres because you're a bit further back. So you've got to be conscious when you're doing this to smile and nod, groups of three, and eyebrow flash as you talk because it definitely has an impact on the person who sees it in terms of how well they accept what you're saying and how likely they are to feel confident with going along with what you're proposing. So let's just say I'm meeting you for the first time on Skype, which which we kind of are, yeah. and I want to sell your house. Mm-hmm. I'm a real estate agent and I want to sell your house. Mm-hmm. And I've been talking to you for a while and all of a sudden you look away off into the distance because you can hear some noise going on and I'm still banging on in the, in front of you. Yeah. And as I said earlier, I think I can remember one of your lessons to to drag people's attention back is to just give them a little elbow touch just to sort of bring them back into the present Without being able to touch your elbow, how do I stop you from being so distracted? Well, I've got this killer value yes. proposition that I'm trying to articulate to you. Yes, well, you're right. And that's one of the things is that when people are on an electronic call like we are now, because the person's not really there in, in, in the flesh, uh, there is a tendency with people to start gazing off looking around because our brain says, oh, they're not really actually here, so therefore I can watch the dog barking, I can look at that bird walking across the road. Respond to that email. I can read this bit of paper here that's here in front of me. Yeah. When you're face-to-face, uh, what you said is right, that you can reach out and touch the point of someone's elbow, that little elbow, but for three seconds or less, not a grab, just a touch as you make a point, and that keeps the person focused on what you're saying. But like this, we can't do it. Or can we? So, for example, here's the point I need to make. Here comes my hand, look. Yeah. So I'm actually touching you. So when I want to make a point, I can do it that way. Second thing I'm going to do is if you look away, okay, look away now as I'm talking. So what, what they've shown is that through those experiments that they did on chimpanzees and monkeys, what the distance was when monkeys were excluded from their parents. So what happens when you look away, there's suddenly there's silence, which drags you back again. I continue. Now, the first or second time that you look away and I do that pause, you won't really notice it. You'll notice that the third or fourth time you start to think, oh, geez, I'm being a bit rude here because I keep looking away. But all you do is just stop talking. You look away, just stop talking. And when they come back, just continue from the word you're on. And the first and second time, people don't even notice you did that. And third or fourth time, they start to think, "Uh uh-oh, there's a gap here. But they realise it's them doing it, not you. Yeah, interesting. That is a really good tip. I'm going to try that one. Well, you're doing a good thing with your hands. As you talk about you and me, you've got you in front. You got me behind. So he said, you and I are talking. And so talking, you went like this. And I said, and then you said, and then I said, and then we did. So by your hands, you're showing me the distance that you're feeling that we are. So if I say something that you didn't like, you were likely to start talking with your hands wider apart if you've been talking with them closer. So suddenly I'll say something that, that you don't like or regret. You're likely to bring your hands apart. That gives me a clue is the fact you might not like what I just said. This is the problem with interviewing experts on body language. Is you're always worried that they're going to start reading you. With SMS, there's none of this issue. I know. But with SMS, you're likely to insult somebody because you think of the, the time that you've sent a one or two line reply to somebody on SMS and you're putting a little funny little line in there and they came back and said how rude you were 
uh, but you're putting a line in. That's why if you're sending SMSs only, you must use emojis. An emoji is a frozen attitude of body language. So if you're putting in something funny, put a little smile on the internet. Women don't have a problem with this. In fact, women can talk to each other just using emojis only. It's almost like hieroglyphics. Now, men get a little bit strange about this. They go, oh, I don't want to go stick it in funny faces. But if you don't put in a face that shows the attitude that you had when you wrote that line, people are likely to go for the negative side that you were being rude, arrogant or sarcastic. Very, very interesting. So those are some really good tips. So if we could just recap those. So on electronic communication, my hands are, are close here, so I'm enjoying what you're saying just for the record. Oh, okay, good. Uh, you're not calling me fat, are you? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Look at your background. Make sure there's nothing in your teeth. That's right. Because people will remember it. Possibly, yeah. Even if you're having a bad day, make sure that when that camera goes on that you're smiling and not sort of slouching and waiting for, oh. Teeth is yeah. <laughs> yep, and we're back. Show your teeth. Raise your eyebrows. Eyebrow flash, yeah. Yeah, and if it seems like someone's sending an email while you're trying to make an important point, just stop. Stop dead. Sit, just stop in the middle of the, the sentence, wherever that word is, and take it up again when, when you take off. It's not aggressive and it keeps the person focused. And nod your head in groups of three to keep people's attention and to keep them talking because what we found with groups of three is you nod, people will talk two to three times longer, give you more information than if you don't nod at all. Yeah, amazing. Now, this is the point in the interview where I'd normally – ask for advice or book recommendations or things like that. And you've written 18 best-selling books and you've taught some amazing people on body language. The one thing that I've got to ask you is Vladimir Putin. Mm -hmm. What was it like teaching a young Vladimir Putin how to understand body language? Well, he's a, he's a very bright guy. He's a pacifist, which you know, people find it difficult to get there. They, they see him as a mean, ruthless type leader. And that's because he doesn't show facial expressions. Mm. During the communist era, which went for 72 years in Russia, if you're in the armed forces, which everybody was at one point, you were not permitted to smile at any one point. You must keep a serious face at all times because smiling indicated you weren't really serious about your job and what you were doing. And smiling people, in fact, would be put in the brig or locked up as an offence. And so smiling was taken off the table in the communist era, in all communist countries. And now we've got the new generation of Gen Ys and millennials who've grown up in that environment. And one of the things that I teach Russians, and I go to Russia three months of the year collectively, I live over there quite a bit for 30 years since it, since communism fell, is it's simple, but it's not easy, teaching them to smile that when you meet people, you must show your teeth, nod your head in groups of three, and eyebrow flash, which seems really simple. But when you've never heard that or never done it, it's a strange thing. As a result, when you talk to Russians, if if you don't know them, you would think that these people are really aggressive. When they talk, they talk louder and in deeper voices. And you see this on television. So, yes, I love you. You are the most beautiful woman who ever lived. So it sounds like they're going to punch you in the face. But that's, that's the communication style that came from the communist army. So I kind of try to uncommunist them. I never say that because that could have consequences. But that's what I do is to teach them how to smile, not the head. Now, but Vladimir Putin, he's got more than 90% people, if you believe, the polls, and I do because I, I, I live there a bit. They love the guy. Particularly the older people, they remember the food lines and having nowhere to live. Now, everybody's got somewhere to live. They've got food. Gen Ys all have uh, university degrees, iPhones, laptops, and largely speak English if they're under 30. And the older people realise that this is really good because you know, they, they never had anything like this. Uh, so the guy is comes across like he is really, really tough and mean, but... He's, in fact, he is an iron fist in a velvet glove. There's no doubt about it. He's very clear on what he's going to do and what, and what needs to be done, and he'll enforce it. But he's, he's a vegetarian. Uh, he spends most of his personal money on homeless people and putting them into uh, childless centres. So he's, he's good for the community on a personal basis as well as a leader. And he's reputed to be the richest man on earth. Nobody really knows for sure whether he is, but that's the, the reputation he's got in most places. But... He's a very smart learner. He's the same age as me, 69. And and going back 30 years ago when he was in the front row of that first seminar that, that Barbara and I did at, uh, at the Winter Palace, which was in the Kremlin up in Leningrad, St. Petersburg, I talked about steepling when you appear on television that you make sure you don't have your fingers laced or hand-holding because they can come across as negative, that when you talk and make a point, you put your fingers together like praying, you steeple. And when you do this, two things happen. First is that you start to feel like you know what you're talking about. And importantly, people who see this, they start thinking, well, you seem to know what you're talking about. It's a good one to do it. Anytime you're, you're talking about any proposition or any property and how good it is, 
if you start to steeple, everybody feels good about what you're talking about. And I still see Vladimir Putin on TV from time to time. Doing that. And there he is, there he is doing his steeple. Yeah. I put that into his seminar because he was running a sem- my first seminar in Russia in 1992 when he was the deputy mayor of St. Petersburg. That was his first job after the KGB. And pretty much all the things I talked about that day, he took them in and still uses them in his own repertoire. And uh, he never comes across as negative or defensive. He always comes across as strong. You won't see him cross his arms. That won't happen. He'll always stand in an attention pose. When he walks, he does a semi-march, which is what leaders do. People who have a semi-march, when we see somebody doing that, without awareness, we go, oh, they must be important. So when someone enters a room, walks across the room, you go, I wonder who that is. They're probably doing a semi-march and they're doing it intentionally. A couple of things that you just said there reminded me there there was a question I actually wanted to ask you just for myself, Mm -hmm. because we've talked a lot about how to read other people's body language, but we haven't talked about how our own body language can impact our demeanor. And I was a big fan of Amy Cuddy's TED Talk back in 2012, and Mm -hmm. You know, she she sort of said two minutes in a power pose can yeah. change how you feel about yourself, lower your cortisol levels. Mm-hmm. And sometimes I do that, you know, like if I'm nervous about an interview, I will stand there like this for, you know, two minutes before I go and do something. What are some of the things that you encourage people to do if they are feeling a bit nervous or flat that can help them feel a little bit better about themselves? That's a really important point, Sam, because... Body language, which makes up 60 to 80% of all the impact we're making on somebody face-to-face. What we actually say, those words we can write on paper, the things you say, account for somewhere between 7 to 10% of the impact. So what you say doesn't matter that much. It's the way you look, appear and behave, and the rest is tone of voice. So 60 to 80% is non-verbal. What we're doing now, we had the sound off. <laughs> now, I didn't say anything, but you can pretty much assess what's going through my mind. I was trying to raise my eyebrows. <laughs> I was looking for that. You didn't do it. Bam! <laughs> you made me fatter. You made me fatter. <laughs> now, body language in simple terms is an outward reflection of your emotional condition. So whatever emotion you're feeling, happy, sad, defeated, proud, winning, uh, negative, pr- whatever you're feeling emotionally is likely to be revealed in gestures, movements, expressions, and postures. So the outer body language, you're simply reading the biggest medium from person, which is their emotions. You're reading how they're feeling. You then match up what you hear them saying in the circumstances under which it's happening. And when you get to be good at this, you can start to figure out what's going on in their mind. And as I mentioned earlier, women are two to three times better instinctively with hard wiring to do this than their male counterparts. And this is why I say to men, that's why you can't lie to women. <laughs> no. Up to their face. You never lie to their face. I mean, you just can't, even small lie, you can't get away with it. SMS, call her on the phone, but don't front up and try to pull off a lie because the chance of getting away with it is not really great particularly if she knows you. (laughs) So it's an outward reflection of your emotions. Now, now here is the point of how this works, that if you intentionally take any gesture that's linked to an emotion, you hold it, and you only have to hold it for 10 seconds. So, for example, let's let's take steepling. See what I'm doing there? Just try this. Mm -hmm. Can I ask anybody watching this this podcast just to copy this? Now, it's almost like they just move it back and forth slightly. Smile with no teeth. Okay, what's going through your mind? I'm not sure, actually. I'm, I'm liking it, though. You've got a plan, haven't you? You've got a sneaky plan. You think you can get away with it. <laughs> now, not showing the teeth is where the sneaky bit comes from. Yeah. Okay. The steeple, which is, this is an isolated gesture, which can occur. Most gestures have to come in groups of at least three, like words in a sentence. But this one is usually can be read in isolation. If you're feeling confident about what you see, feel, experience, or circumstances in what you're saying, Chance are you might start using a steeple gesture. It looks like this. Now you want to have it around about chest height. Don't have it up too high because you come across as arrogance. That's what we found. The higher you hold it up, the more arrogant people perceive you to be. You don't have it down sitting in your lap because you look like you aren't going to say anything. You're smart for most of it. So you have it about chest level. But when you do that, two things happen. First, you start to feel like, hey, I've got this together. Yeah. And this is a really good thing to have in situations that you mentioned before where you've got to give a maybe a presentation or stand up in front of a group or in real estate, you're standing up in front of a group the whole time. You are in the public speaking business where there's one person or a group. So if, as you talk about something, if you start to steeple, particularly in a situation where you're feeling nervous, within about 10 seconds, it starts to reverse itself. Within two minutes, you are actually living that emotion. So now suddenly you're saying, this, I've got this together. 
And secondly, the most important thing at this point is the people who see you doing this sound like you're doing now and you're doing it beautifully, they start saying to themselves, you seem to know what you're talking about. Now, you might not know what you're talking about. That's the reality. But you look like you do and now you're starting to feel like you do. And, uh, again, if you take this to the extreme, uh, this is where professional actors come into play, where I teach this to actors. If they're going to come across as a powerful, confident person, we'll teach them to put in things like steepling and, and raising up and down the soles of their feet. But a good actor instinctively knows to do that anyway to create the character. Mm. And during the breaks of filming, good actors stay in character. They remain that person, keeping the emotions so they don't have to relearn it. So if you keep steepling like you're doing now, just make that part of your repertoire. Here's what will happen. First of all, when you start doing this in front of people, you start thinking, oh, they know what I'm doing. <laughs> no, they don't. You only think that because maybe you've never you've never done this before consciously. Yeah. And doing it on purpose, you feel like a dork. You really feel like you're naked and exposed. You think that, that they know what you're they, they don't know unless they watch this podcast, then they do know. <laughs> so by doing it, you change your whole attitude. So if you're going into any face-to-face where you're nervous, just get behind a corner, start steepling, lift your chin up high and just go up and down the soles of your feet and visualise how well this is going to go and how you're saying all the right things. Because people only say the wrong things, they only screw up in face-to-face situations because in their mind they've practised that before they went in. Oh, I don't want to bugger this up. They think about what they don't want. In fact, they're rehearsing what they don't want and then it becomes a reality. So by rehearsing what you do want and putting the body language into it as well, you walk in there and you've got it together. Yeah, amazing. I feel like I'm making excuses now, but the reason I sit here like this is because I do tend to talk with my hands a lot and I'm kind of just <laughs> keep, measure up. Keep, measure up. keeping keeping a lid on it. But um, well, you're an interesting case with a measure because you're using the distance between your hands to show how important what it is you're talking about relative to the other things you said. All right. Okay. So for example, why should people get such a big pay rise? And what do I get? <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to watch that in the future. Yeah. So thank you so much for joining us on the podcast today. It's been amazing. Oh, and, 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 not, yes. yep. and I think that agents listening to this are going to get a lot out of it, particularly with the social distancing and stuff that's going on at the moment. I said earlier that you've written 18 best-selling books, which is a lot. At the end of an interview, I normally say, is there one thing that you want people to remember? But what I'd like to say is out of those 18 books, if you're a real estate agent right now, which is the best one for them to go and absorb? I'd recommend two. The first one would be the definitive book of body language. Yep. As a real estate agent, you are a public speaker. That's the reality. You're not an office worker. You're not a filer or a clerk. You are to get money to make the business go. You're a public speaker. And uh, body language shows you how to make that first impression, particularly the first four minutes where people form up 90%. And you can stage manage your appearance. That's the important thing. You can stage manage by rehearsal and by practice. And reading people tells you where you're at in a face-to-face. Are they with you or against you? Are they hedging? Are they holding back? Have they got more money? Uh, are they telling you a lie, hoping to see if there's a better price? What are they doing? And when you walk in feeling nervous and you start to steeple and talk, you'll feel so much better. And the great thing about this is that your ability to be able to succeed in any business, and real estate really highlights this, is your ability to get people to buy you. And if people buy you, and they'll do that in under four minutes, if they buy you, there's a good chance they'll buy what goes with you. And if they don't buy you, they won't buy anything that goes with you, even if it's a good idea. So body language would be the first. The second would be the answer, which is our latest book on the part of the brain that drives success. Is to, it shows you how to work out how to get anything you want in your life which for most people they only dream about. This shows you how the brain works and drives you to get it or not. So the answer, I think I've read about this book. This is the book that says that instead of providing answers, you should provide more questions. Is is that that book? Well, actually, no, that's another book. That's another book. Oh, that's a book called Questions Are the Answers that if you're in face-to-face selling. Now, you know when people object to something, they only object to a salesperson if you said something that was objectionable. <laughs> so if, you don't, if you don't say anything, nobody can object. So ra- what that book teaches you, rather than saying something, you ask a question. If you ask a question that gets the other person to say the same thing, then it's true. If you say it, they'll raise an objection to it because you said it. Mm. Well, we're going to leave links to all of those books in the show notes for everyone so that they can come and discover more. And I hope people watch a few more videos. And I think you've got an event coming up in November too, don't you? We do three or four of those a year. We invite maximum of 25 to 30 people who come to our, our property here in Budroom, Queensland. We, 
we live in a resort style place here where we have our own conference center and we have lakes and and it's just a beautiful place. And over a weekend, Saturday and Sunday, we teach people not only communication skills on one day, how to suss people out, how to make impression, but importantly with this next one coming up, how to work out how to get anything you want rather than struggling with it and working out why you haven't got it. So that goes up. It's a Monday, it's a Saturday and a Sunday. And uh, the results we get from this has been pretty remarkable. I mean, we've only been doing these for three years. They've been cancelled now until the end of the year because of this crisis. Uh, the next one's in November. But if you go onto our website, which is P's my name, peas.tv, you'll see the details of it. And that's a life-changing event for anybody. Yeah, amazing. Well, we will definitely leave some links to that as well. Alan Pease, thank you so much. My pleasure, Sam. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Elevate from Elite Agent. To download your written action guide from this podcast containing extra tips, links and shortcuts, visit EliteAgentElevate.com.